I, I have this message that's been on my heart for quite some time, and, and uh, I just love how God orchestrates events and things. And as I shared with you um, through this series, as I've been talking about the feasts of God, I felt like God wanted me to begin to invest myself in study about the original Pentecost and what it was about. Most majority of people are familiar with um, the New Testament Pentecost and the events that are there, but very few people understand what originally took place with the original Pentecost. And so we have been in a series going through the study of the feasts of Israel. No, the feasts of God. They're, I keep falling back into that. It's not the feasts of Israel. It's the feasts of God that Israel observes. And, uh, and so we've been looking at that, and I don't know where we're at in, as far as how many we've covered or all that. Um, but we, we're spending some time looking at the Feast of Pentecost then and now. And so... Um, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11, it'll be a little bit before we get there. Um, it's one of our texts this morning. And then turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 4. <clears throat> Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revelation that you have kept for us from the foundations of the earth. Before the earth was laid, you said you pre-planned that we would be here. Everyone in this room have been pre-planned by God to have the Holy Spirit bring revelation. And so God, as much as we know how, we want to pay attention to what you're saying. And once again, Father, we don't need what Gary has to say. We need what the Holy Spirit has to say. And so, God, would you, through your word, bring revelation that you have planned for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Part of me would like to begin back at uh, part one of what is the Feast of Pentecost then and now. We did part one. We did part two. But if I re-preach those messages, it'd be a while before we got to part three. So you'll have to go back at the information table and get my notes from the last two messages. And then you can also go on to Facebook and or YouTube and watch them. The um, addresses for those are in our bulletins. But I just really feel like God is saying we need to understand what he has to say about the word Pentecost. And, and I want to unpack it just a touch. The word Pentecost can be a scary word. And for various reasons that people have experienced or whatever, when you hear the word Pentecost or whatever, it's not always in a positive light that you hear it or have seen it. But um, the word Pentecost simply means 50. Isn't that scary? Yeah. <laughs> 50, okay? And so the word Pentecost means from the day of first fruits, Resurrection Sunday, you count 50 days until you have the happening of the Feast of Weeks, or in the New Testament, the Greek name for 50 is Pentecost, Penta, pentagram, five-sided, okay? And so uh, um, we're looking at the Feast of Pentecost and how God unpacked it. At the original Pentecost, um, they were in the desert and it was 50 days from them being delivered from uh, um, Egypt and bondage. The law was given by God to Moses for the children of Israel. Now when the law was given, that was a big deal. It was an incredibly good thing. David said, God, I love your law. I delight in your law. Why? Because the law of God gives you an understanding of how to go and come into the presence of God. Where, how do you worship a God that is this awesome? And so in the Old Testament, God gave to Moses the law on the day of first, first weeks, uh, um, 
The, the Feast of Weeks, there we go. And, and uh, so then in the New Testament, we find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Basically what that was saying is when there was 50 days from the day of resurrection, the Holy Spirit was given in Acts chapter 2. And as I said earlier, um, months ago, I felt like God challenged me about What was the original Pentecost about? And so we have spent time two Sundays ago, then last Sunday, talking about the meaning of Pentecost and and God's giving of the law and the Holy Spirit coming in Acts chapter 2. And so this morning, we're going to continue with that thought and that view. Now, last week, we looked at the scriptures showing us in the New Testament, and actually all the way through the Old Testament, the time that we have doesn't allow me to go into the depth of the study. I would love to to get you up to some of the speeches but all the way through the Bible and in the New Testament, it talks about three different baptisms that we can be involved in. And I can't re-preach that message, go watch it online or get the notes and sit down with God and the scripture and see. It's very clear in scripture. There are three different baptisms. The first one I want to look at is the baptism the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. And that scripture is found in 2 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. You are all baptized into one body. And so the Holy Spirit, what he does is baptizes us into salvation. And then you see in the second baptism that we looked at is the baptism that Jesus does. He baptizes us with or in the Holy Spirit. And and, um, remember when Jesus went down to the water to be water baptized, John said, "Um, you should baptize me. And Jesus said, no, this is important that I do. And, And John, talking about Jesus, said, I baptize you in water to repentance, but he who is coming after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And so we see that John, all four of the Gospels have this account of John saying, when Jesus comes, the Messiah, what the Messiah baptizes with is the Holy Spirit, is separate and different than what John was doing. And so that leads us to the third one that Jesus, um, before he went away, he said, I want you to go make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He was talking about water baptism, and that's the baptism that we are involved in. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, the church and or culture has moved this job into the job of the clergy to water baptize people. If someone's a new convert, they need to be water baptized. What do we do? Let's take them to the pastor and have the pastor have a baptismal service. And, and, and that's kind of become a traditional, but that's not what Jesus said. He said, I want you to go make disciples and I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, again, don't have time to unpack this any further. Go back last week. There's three different baptisms. There's the baptism the Holy Spirit does. He baptizes us into salvation. The baptism that Jesus does, he baptizes me with or in the Holy Spirit. And then there's water baptism. And so each of those three are unique and distinct, and they are not the same. So as you study them, you can see in Scripture there are three. Well, in our text this morning, we're going to look, start with Acts chapter 1. As I've studied this morning, last night, and, and, or this week, getting ready for, I didn't know what text to actually take. So let's just, let's just pick one right here. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 is a great place to start to launch the rest of this message for. Acts chapter 1. Verse 4, as Jesus was talking with his disciples, again, just a little bit of background, he had risen from the dead, he went, ascended to the Father, he was presented to him as the first fruits, 
He was accepted and he came back. After he came back, uh, uh, John says he met with the disciples and he said he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So that's salvation. And then he was there on the earth with his disciples going around Jerusalem in that area preaching and teaching for 40 days. And that's where we have this account taking place. So Acts chapter 1, he's been there about 40 days and he begins to teach with them. In verse 4 he said, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait until the promise of the Father. I want you to see this. Jesus, just before he left, said, don't go into ministry yet. I want you to not depart from Jerusalem to go into the uttermost parts of the earth yet until I want you to wait for the promise of the Father, okay? Which you uh, um, which he said you have heard of me. Verse 5, for John truly baptized you with water. Okay, that has to do with repentance. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Can you see the two different baptisms and just in this one verse? John baptized you with water. Water baptism has to do with the understanding of death, burial, and resurrection. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And the disciples, being very human and having an agenda on their own, said in verse 5, Are you going to restore the kingdom now that you've risen from the dead and shown everybody you're, you're the king of king type things? And Jesus said, It is not for you to know the times of the season which the Father has put into his own authority. Verse 8, But you shall receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Next phase, outside Jerusalem is Judea, surrounding area. The next phase into Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus said this baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to give you power to be witnesses here, out there, out there, and out there. All right? And so... Um, I want to point out in this verse, I touched on it a little bit, a, a lot of people, and I, I myself have made the mistake of saying the last instructions Jesus gave to the church was go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, as important as that is, that's not his last instructions. His last instructions are not to go, but to wait until. It's right here. If you see the rest of this verse, verse 8 then goes into verse 9. When he had said these things, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud and received him into the air. So the last instructions of Jesus to his followers were not to go preach, go minister, but to wait until... The promise of the Father is given to you. And when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, you receive power to be witnesses. So he does want us to go, but he wants us to go with authority and power that comes from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the question that I ask at the end of last week's message having looked at the, that message and, and about um, does Jesus want me to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We'll get back to that in just a second. It's been my experience in my lifetime that I find a lot of people that are very casual with this answer. Does Jesus want me to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, one of the Normal tendencies of human nature is if something someone doesn't if something doesn't make sense or if you're unsure or nervous about it, let's just set it on the shelf. But if you've been a Christian for a while and as you study this, I want you to come to the conclusion: Does Jesus want me to have this experience? Isn't that what he is saying here? I want you to be witnesses into the rest of the world, but wait until you're baptized. So 
the answer to that question that I posed last week, does Jesus want me to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. Okay? So this week, what I felt like I wanted to share is, okay, so if all that's in place, the question that I have this morning, I want to unpack just a little bit. I can't cover it in depth. We don't have enough time. I I want to do a a series on this. I'll probably start this as soon as I can get my ducks in a row. But sometimes for me, ducks are like cats. (laughs) You you get them lined up and then you can't find the first one. And where did I place that or whatever. But so the rest of this message, what I want to do is answer or look at some of the answers to the question, if Jesus wants me to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father and it's part of what the Bible says should be for our, uh, our lives, the question is, who can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and how do you receive it? All right? So that's what I want to spend our time with. The answer of who can be baptized in the Holy Spirit, let's start with the baseline of the only requirements I can see in Scripture for someone to be a candidate to receive this promise of the Father is that you need to be a born-again Christian. That's it. You have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. That's the only requirement to be able to receive this promise of the Father is that you believe in Jesus as your Lord. I, I like this because it has nothing to do with your doctrine your denominational background. It has nothing to do with your gender, thank God. It has nothing to do with your age. Do you know there's not a junior Holy Spirit? (laughs) The Holy Spirit can move through a child as much as he can the most spiritually mature person in the room. And it's probably not who you're thinking of right now. Okay, it's probably not me. There's other people out there that just trump me in those places. But what I am saying is um, the Holy Spirit, being, being able to receive the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with your age. It has nothing to do with your status. Um, where in, it has nothing to do with your maturity level. It has nothing to do whether you have your theology correct or not. I just love that. One of the times I was, I was studying and all of a sudden I realized as I was looking at when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the house of Cornelius, I can guarantee that gr- house group of pagans did not have very good theology. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Right. Yeah. Okay? And then when the Holy Spirit was moving in the church at Corinth, we can read the, the Paul begin to put them in line and correct their theology. Their theology was weird. And yet God did not say, until you get your act straight, I am not going to give you this promise. The one requirement that I have to measure up with is I believe in God. I believe Jesus is the Lord and my Savior. So that's the first and foundation is to believe that Jesus is is Son of God. Um, Peter said, this promise is to you and your children and all who are as far off, as many as the Lord your God shall call. So what that tells me is it's not just for some select Christians, it's for all who believe in the name of Jesus. I have worked with people that um, when they asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, things didn't happen the way they thought. Um, More specifically, they didn't start speaking in tongues right away. So they came to the conclusion, this must only be for certain people. Well, that's not what Peter said. When the crowd asked him, what's going on here? He said, this is what Joel talked about. This is the promise of the Father given, and it's for you, your children, and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord your God shall call. And I just want you to know, I'm, I'm pretty far out there. And yet it's for me. So if it's for me, it's for you. Okay? But don't just take it because I said so. See what the scripture says. The Bereans were, um, were, were patted on the back by Paul because he said they studied the scripture daily to see if the things that Paul said were true. So I just want to encourage you to be a student of the word, especially in this area. 
Don't take just what a denomination or a pastor says about it, but get into the Word and see if what the things they're saying comes from the Word and then allow the Holy Spirit to settle in your heart. All right. In, in Acts chapter 1 that we just read, Jesus said the baptism of the Holy Spirit that was poured out in Acts chapter 2 was the promise of the Father. That's a key phrase that I want us to understand and realize. So this gift, it's a gift, right? It's a gift from the Father to His children. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father to His kids. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. If this gift is from Father God and Jesus baptizes me with the Holy Spirit, why is there so much fear attached to it? Can I say that again? If this is a gift from the Father that Jesus baptizes me with, why is fear so attached to the topic of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I believe fear is from the enemy. And especially if the fear keeps me from peace that God had intended me to live with. So any doctrine of Scripture, if fear is involved, I just present to you the enemy wants to keep me away from peace that I should be able to live with. Does that make sense? And this scripture here in Luke chapter 11 just kind of highlights and identifies uh, um, what we're talking about. In Luke chapter 11, um, Jesus told a parable about a friend who had someone come to his house in the middle of the night and, and he was hungry and whatever. So it's like me going to, over to Glenn Moran's house. He's worked hard all day, and I had someone come to my house. They needed food. I didn't have the food. So I went to Glenn Moran's house, and I knocked on the door. Nothing. I knocked on the door. Nothing. And, and the dog starts barking, and Glenn finally comes up. What are you doing, Gary? Go home. Said, no, I have a friend that needs some food. And, and, and Glenn's going, Gary, it's in the middle of the night. Go home. We'll do this tomorrow. And I just keep shamelessly knocking because of our relationship. And finally, Glenn opens the door and gives me a sack of potatoes and said, I got these from D. <laughs> <laughs> now go home. So, so Jesus told this parable and he said, so I want you to realize when you need something from the Father, that you can go shamelessly knock on the door and say, Father, I need something. Father, I need something. This is the context of this scripture. Okay? And so, Chapter 11, verse 9, So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who finds, to him who knocks it will be opened. Verse 11, If the son asks for a bread and, um, of any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? How bizarre is that? So he said, if you, having an evil-based nature, know how to be good to your own kids, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Isn't that an interesting scripture? So if this is a gift from the Father, why the fear? Because the Father's not going to give me something to hurt me. And if you can see in Scripture that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is in a positive thing, the question is, where's that fear coming from? I just, I just present you that the enemy knows if I can be afraid of something, I will avoid it. And if he can taint 
the Father's intention, I will avoid it. But if Jesus wants to give me this gift, and the Bible talks about it in a positive light, and it's from the Father, I need to recognize where the fear is coming from. I've been around this all my life, okay? I've been in some pretty weird circumstances. And I believe that many people and many churches have wrongly misrepresented the things of God. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of the high things, especially since we're talking about it. But as you've heard me in the last few Sundays, you know, I have watched all my life well-meaning Christians pervert the love of the Father to people and highlight hell instead of the love of God. They focus on the things you shouldn't do. And, and growing up as a teen, I, I came from a very legalistic background. I think that God has brought me out of that. But um, when I was growing up, you couldn't wear shorts in public because that could send you to hell. You don't, you don't go play pool in a pool hall because that could send you to hell. In my family, we didn't have face, face cards, playing cards. No, no, that was wrong. And God help anybody that smoked or drank or did any, because those, all those things. And, and um, I, just, I just say that, you know, there's nothing like a beautiful truth of God that the church can't pervert and twist. <laughs> and I think when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this gift of the Father, there has been some well-meaning people that have turned it out to be weird. One of the things I love, Robert Morris says this, and I just, I, I grabbed a lot of his stuff that I'm using, and, and, and one of the things he says is, you know, the Holy Spirit is my friend. I've known him, for me, the majority of my life, all of my adult life, I've known him on an intimate basis, and he's not weird. There are people that make him look weird, but it's not his fault. They would be weird if they didn't have the Holy Spirit, okay? And so, some people focus on hell instead of love. Some focus on the abuse of tongues instead of the Holy Spirit and focusing on just one of the manifestations of the Spirit instead of the gift of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit and Him. And so our enemy does not want me to have the happening that Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 eight. you shall receive power to be witnesses. He doesn't want me to have that. And so if he can confuse the topic and if he can get me to think the gift of the Father will hurt me and sometimes even that it's demonic in origin, wow, something that just always ticks me off is it's the enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. It's the enemy that brings sickness on people. And then the other people say, see what God is doing. He's disciplining you through sickness. God's not that way. That's the enemy. He brings the sickness on, then he stands back and makes everybody think it's God's fault. And, and sometimes with this whole topic, the, the enemy throws a bad light on the Father's intention to bless you. You got to hear this this morning. This is the Father's pleasure to bless you with the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay, back to my notes. Page two, top of the page. A fundamental foundation, you've got to get this, is um, to, to remember is when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you receive Him. He is the gift, Okay. You don't just receive a gift, you receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, He gives you the ability to operate in the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And in my notes, you can see I gave uh, uh, places where it lists the different manifestations of the Spirit. That word manifestation is a big word that just simply means this is how the Holy Spirit operates and or makes himself known. And so with the Holy Spirit comes the ability to operate in any of the gifts of the Spirit, not just one of them, but you now have access to all of them. For instance, you don't receive the gift of tongues or the gift of prophecy. You receive the Holy Spirit. That one gift of the Holy Spirit is a multifunctional and different multi-manifestation 
gift. It, it's just humongous. And, and, and sometimes I think Paul was not trying to identify each one of them individually. I think they more so often that you can't actually tell exactly which one of the gifts is the Holy Spirit manifesting right now? I think sometimes they're too complex and I don't need to understand it. But my point is, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you receive Him. And when you have the gift of the Holy Spirit, all those other gifts can manifest in your life when the Holy Spirit says you're ready for that to happen. Or as you learn, or as you operate, or as you yield yourself, or as you exercise your senses, I believe then they come into play. Um, too often tongues gets all the attention because it seems to be the most unique. So... When you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you don't receive tongues, you receive the Holy Spirit. As a result, you can operate in the gift of tongues. That's the way I understand it, all right? Now let's, uh, let's switch to the question, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? We talked about who can receive it, let's talk about how. <clears throat> And again, I'm just scratching the surface because it's so complex and there's a million stories out there and a million different experiences on their own. So I'm just going to touch a little bit. In Acts chapter 2, as they were praying, it simply says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. On your own, you can look at that. Acts chapter 1, verse 2 through whatever. It, it just begins to tell you some of the experiences of that initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But various other places in Scripture, you can see see some of that. Let's turn to Acts chapter 9. I didn't have you preload your Bibles with this because it's just easy, easy to find. I said Acts chapter 9. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8. I want us to look at verse 14. Acts chapter 8 verse 14. And when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for as yet he had not fallen upon them, and they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. I want you to get this. Two different baptisms, right? They had heard about an outpouring of God's presence in Samaria. And so... They sent the apostles there that baptized or prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit because they had already been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means they had already been water baptized to repentance. So verse 16, as if yet the Holy Spirit had not fallen on them, they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. I'm going to stop there. How does it happen? Well, according to this, it says that they prayed for them, they laid hands on them, and they received it. Now, the original one in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, no one laid hands on them. They were just praying. They were in one place, in one accord, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the Holy Spirit was poured out. So how does it happen? Sometimes it just happens like that. Here, they laid hands on them and prayed for them. Let's look at Acts chapter 10 and see how it happened there. Acts chapter 10, all the way through this chapter, it talks about when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. The verse we just read said, as of yet, the Holy Spirit had not been poured out on the Gentiles. Here we have when that takes place. How does it take place? We don't have time to read the whole chapter, but the house of Cornelius was a Gentile house. They had been praying, God, we want more of you. God gave Peter a vision, and remember the sheet coming down with all a bunch of unclean animals in there? He said, I want you to kill and eat. And Peter goes, no, I'm a good Jew. I don't eat pork. And Jesus said, don't call what I call clean unclean. Now, he wasn't talking about pork. He was talking about people. The Hebrew people felt the Gentiles were outside the promise of the Father because they hadn't understood uh, um, all the Old Testament the way God said, no, if they follow me, they can come in and be grafted into the Hebrew people. And so God dealt with Peter's prejudice here, and he said, 
there's some men coming. I want you to go with them. And so Peter went with them because God told him to. He wasn't supposed to go to Gentiles. He wasn't supposed to go into their house. He wasn't supposed to do this. But God had told him, and so he did it. And he went in, and he began to preach to them about Jesus Christ and being saved and what Jesus rose from the dead and things along that line. Let's pick up the story at verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, Jewish people that were with Peter, were astonished, as many that had came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles of all people. And they heard them speaking with tongues and magnifying God Then Peter answered, can anybody forbid them to be water baptized Um, since they've received the Holy Spirit? And he commanded them to be baptized in water and in in the name of the Lord Jesus. And and they asked him to stay a few more days. So in this account, how does it happen? Well, Peter didn't lay hands on anybody. He was just preaching to them about Christ. I think all the room, all of a sudden they go, Yeah, that's what I want. I want Jesus. They didn't have to say a sinner's prayer. They didn't meet the requirements of are you in or you're not in. Their hearts turned to God. And at that moment, Jesus said, okay, Peter, could you step aside? I'm just about ready to baptize people. I don't need you anymore, thanks. And he was still talking, kind of like me right now. Anyway, and so the Holy Spirit fell on them because their hearts were open to what God wanted. And I want you to notice, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and then they were water baptized. So one doesn't have to be before the other. You can be baptized in the Holy Spirit before you're baptized in water. You can be baptized in water before you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't think God cares. (laughs) Right? There is a certain element there that it's up to the surprise of the Father. Oh, I just can't wait to do this one. This is going to be so fun because God does uniquely with each individual. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, let's look at one more uh, account of how does it happen. Acts chapter 19, turn there with me. Acts chapter 19, starting with verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And when he was there, he found some disciples. Disciples of who? Of Jesus Christ. Followers of Christ. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so he asked about their salvation. Then how were you saved? How did you come to the knowledge of Christ? And he said to them, What were you baptized? And he said, into John's baptism, which was water and repentance, right? Verse 4, then Paul said, John baptized you with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him whom came after him, that is in Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in water and in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, and when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. I'm going to stop there. You can read the rest later. So we see in this account, how did it happen there? All Paul did, he said, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Yes. What was your salvation experience? We've been, we, we believed John's baptism. Now he water baptized them again. I don't understand quite why. It kind of doesn't matter. But I I want you to see that there was two different baptisms that was taking place. How did it happen? He said he laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So the question, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? First of all, uh, um, since it's a gift of the Father, all I need to do is simply ask. Father, I heard that you had a gift for me. Can I have the gift that you have for me? That's just simple and natural. And that's as complex as it has to be. So all you have to do is ask. Now, sometimes in my experience, I've been around this a lot. 
I've seen a lot of people filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit just like that with the speaking of other tongues happened right then, okay? I don't want to get lost in the weeds, but um, every time is uniquely different. Every time I I see someone uh, um, get baptized, it's as different as they are individually. And you you got to bear with me. I, I, I ran this past my wife last night, and she helped me see that I'm reverting to what I consider my old-time Pentecostal belief that the evidence is all about the tongues. I don't have time to get into this. If you want to talk to me later, I will. Let me just give you a few stories about my experiences, how people, what experiences and happen when they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Bottom line is, I ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whether someone lays hands on me or prays for me, I think that's an excellent way of doing it, but it doesn't have to. I have known people that um, went to their bedroom and just simply say, God, I want this gift. Now, I believe this on a foundational level. All I have to do is ask And when you ask, you shall receive. Remember the scripture that we read in Luke chapter 11? Ask of the Father and he will give you the Holy Spirit. I believe all I have to do is ask. Well, how do you know when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's not the question I want you to ask. I want you to ask how much deeper can you get into him? Okay? I don't like this next illustration by itself because it leads to division. But far too often there's been an argument. Let's look at the one can, uh, um, about predestination or um, can you get saved and backslide or you get saved and you're always saved, that type of thing. Uh, can, can I uh, get saved and then backslide? I think that's a stupid question. The whole Uh, um, background of it is not from the heart of the Father. It's coming from a legalistic stand. It's kind of like saying, if I ride in the back of a pickup, can I fall out? Or, if I ride in the back of the pickup and I lean against the tailgate, can I fall out? It's a stupid question. What are you doing trying to fall out in the first place, okay? (laughs) How close can you get to the cab of the driver and live in the center of what God's doing. So the, the point of the question, I think, can, can just muddy the whole thing, such as, do you have to speak in tongues to show that you're baptized of the Holy Spirit? I think it's a wrong question. I think the spirit of the, uh, of the whole package is, God, I want more of you. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what happens in my life. I may care, but it doesn't matter. God, I give you permission to go beyond my cares, and I just want the gift you've given to me. And so I've known people. Okay, bottom line. Let me get back to the bottom line. Bottom line is, I believe when you ask, God gives you the Holy Spirit. How do you know? I don't know. And I don't know it's mine to judge. And as I said last week, as a pastor, I am not a line judge or a referee to examine your life to say, no, you're out of line. Or what. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I'm a coach to show you this is the way to get more of God. So how do you know? You get alone with the Father and say, God, manifest yourself in me any way, shape, or form. I want the gifts that you said the Holy Spirit gives. So bottom line, keep going back there. I ask by faith, I believe, I receive. Okay? It's very much like salvation, right? How do you know you're saved? Well, you quit smoking and you quit lying and not necessarily right uh, Linda is a great example her and her <sighs> I'm going to use Duffy not Linda her, her husband that died 20 years ago 98 um, he was just an excellent incredible guy um, he worked on the docks in Seattle um, a crane operator. And so if you know anything about the occupation, pretty rough 
person. And he himself said he would get stoned and drunk almost every day before he went to work. He'd get up in the crane and he'd turn Shambach on just to laugh at him. Well, one time he, he broke his foot. Shambach is a, a very, very much like that, loud and boisterous and in your face, I think. And uh, um, we don't mind that by any not at all. So. so he had a broken foot. He was up in the crane and he was in, in much pain. He, was, he had his Jack Daniels there, help him take the edge off what he had already edged off. And anyway, Shambout come on and he literally turned him on to laugh at him and make fun of him. Isn't that fun? Shambach said, you know, there's someone out there, if you're hurting and you need, you need healing, I want you to lay hands on whatever's wrong, and I'm going to pray and God's going to heal you. And he was in so much pain, he said, let's try it. So he reached down and he put his hand on his foot and Shambach prayed and he was healed just like that. He started jumping up and down on that foot. He ran to his truck. And, and anyway, they got involved in church. I love their church. Their church didn't pull them aside and say, no, you not, need to stop doing drugs, you need to stop drinking, and you need to start doing this and this and this. No, they just loved on them. And as they come and experience the love of God, all of a sudden, Duffy woke up and going, I don't think I should be smoking weed anymore. I don't think I should be drinking anymore. And their life changed. And Duffy's experience with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I've used this a lot. He says, it's as if I received power steering and power brakes. Now, if you've never driven an old truck that didn't have power steering, power brakes, you know what I'm talking about. You, or you don't know what I'm talking about because you've got to stand on that brake and you've got to... But the Holy Spirit changes lives. You don't have to measure up. I've got to get back to my notes because I don't know where I was going. It was just really fun. <laughs> Every time it happens, it's unique. As unique as people are. Have a good friend. He's gone to be with the Lord. Used to be one of our youth workers. He was killed in a tragic accident here in Sea Lake. Uh, Brian Lovelace, when he experienced this, he got saved, quit drinking, and they said, you should be water baptized. Okay, I'm in. And when he come up out of the water, he began to speak in other tongues. He was instantly filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time he was water baptized in the Holy Spirit. Next time he was a water baptism, I think it was around here, um, he noticed that not everybody was coming up. No one was coming up out of the water speaking in other tongues. And he came to us and said, I thought this is the way it works. It's, it's not. It works uniquely different every time. My dad was a minister and, and um, raised in a pastor's home. And at some point, um, I don't, don't know enough of this account, but he wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he said, God, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And nothing happened. For two years, he just kept praying. He was wanting the evidence of tongues to back up the fact that he had been filled. Okay? And so for two years, he just kept saying, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. And sometimes I've watched people get lost in seeking the gift of tongues instead of just getting lost in who God is. Because we see the tongues as a sign instead of the presence. Now for him, at some point, I think he was just kind of, you know, off in his own little world and he was at the altar one time and he was just worshiping God at the altar. Back in the day when you, you, we had altar service, you'd have an altar up front and people would come up front. I think it was a good thing. Sometimes, it's, anyway, he was, at the, he was at the altar and all of a sudden he could hear someone speaking in tongues and he looked around to see who it was and he realized it was him. Okay? Tongues did not identify he had been filled right then. It was that the manifestation happened then. I love this story. My wife and as I was sharing on this trip, we talked about this. When Heather Ann was a child, one of her children's church workers taught on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that this is a gift for you. And she said to the children's church kids, Next Sunday after church, I want you to, no matter what the pastor preaches about, when there's an altar call, which there used to be all the time after church, you come to the altar and spend time with God. I just want you to go forward and spend time at the altar and ask God for the gift. So Heather ran. She, uh, incidentally, which is just coincidence, 
The pastor had no idea what the children's church workers had been working on. He had no clue about that. That night, guess what his topic was? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. How to receive the Holy Spirit. And so he gave an invitation. Heather Ann went down to the, the altar and said, Father, this is a gift you said is mine, and I know you won't give me something that will hurt me. Now, if you know my wife's background, her earthly father was not to be trusted. So probably with some suspicion, she was saying, Father, you got gifts for me, and I'm going to take it by faith that they're good for me. Is it, I don't know if I can trust you. Because of my experience in life. And so God gave her the baptism of the Holy Spirit right then and there because she asked for the gift. She also began to speak in other tongues right then and there. No one else around her knew it. She got up, walked back to her seat and sat down. And for the rest of her life, she has been able to operate in the gifts of the, the Spirit. Now, some would say, well, I thought it had to be demonstrative and loud. Well, it's not her nature. If you see my wife, sometimes I'm watching this movie and I'm dying laughing. I'm looking, don't you think that's funny? She goes, I'm laughing. No. <laughs> she's smiling, but she's not laughing. I think sometimes it has to do with your interaction with the Father and your personal dynamics of, in, of relationship. I have been places when, when someone received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, everybody for four blocks knew what was going on. Something weird's going on over there, okay? And, and then sometimes you just don't know. So you can't look at there to be specific evidence, oh, they got it, they didn't. I just say, I think you should ask in faith and let the Father worry about all the dynamics of that. Let me give you a couple more illustrations and I'm trying to close. One year I was at, I, I, I have 25 years experience of, of running team camp and I, I picked the baton up from Don. He, he made me run with it for a while and then he said, okay, you're on your own. Um, so I was in charge of, of uh, our teen camps and um, it's been my experience a lot of Holy Spirit dynamics happen at camps because kids' hearts are free and open. And um, there was this one uh, time there was some young adults that were going to our church. I said, come to teen camp. You don't have to stay in the cabins with the teens, but come and be a part of that. And um, uh, I was... After the, the preaching time, we had altar time, and I was up front. I was praying for kids, and I looked around, and she said, can you pray for me? And I said, what, what do you want from God? She said, I want to see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I said, okay. And so, you know how your mind works in milliseconds, nanoseconds type things, more than whatever? As I was reaching out to lay hands on her head to pray for her, in my heart, I was saying, Father, why is it I don't see what the book of Acts says when you lay hands on people, they receive the Holy Spirit? I don't get why it doesn't work that way. And so that's going on in my mind as I was laying hands on her saying, Father, you see her heart, she asked for the Holy Spirit. And is, all of a sudden I realized she's speaking in tongues. God, ha God did it that way. And the manifestation of tongues was there also. I've been at camp where I've had, I've watched a happening where we had 50, 60 kids up front and the speaker said, I want you to just put your hands up like you're receiving a gift of the Father and I want you to just simply say, Father, I want the gift of the Holy Spirit. And just like that, 50 kids, 60 kids started speaking in other tongues. I don't know how or why it happens the way it does happen. I just know it happens unique every time. And so... Uh, um, one of the things that I want to clarify is I don't think <clears throat> I don't think tongues needs to be what your focus is. Some don't seem to manifest in tongues, and yet I watch them operate in the other gifts that the Holy Spirit has, such as words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and, and they'll be talking to someone and say, you know. I don't know if this is you or not, but I just feel like God's saying this about you and they're going, wow, that is exactly right. That's a gift the Holy Spirit manifests as he's in you. And so bottom line is, how? It's kind of between you and the Holy Spirit. But don't get lost in the weeds of saying it has to happen this way. <sighs> I love this topic, and I could, go, I could go a couple more hours, even without notes. But we do need to come to a close. 
my hope is that you become so in love with the Father that you're not afraid of what he has. And if you have experienced doubt or fear about this topic, simply get into the Word and the Holy, allow the Holy Spirit to bring you to a conclusion that is between you and Him. It doesn't have to measure up to mine, but allow the study of the Word to show you what the Father has for you. I want us to bow our heads in a word of prayer this morning. God, I pray this morning that in this place that you would come with revelation to cause us to realize you have things for us that are good. I pray, Father, for anybody that's wrestling with these, this doctrine, this choice, this, that you would bring us to a place of healing, of wholeness to where we can trust you. Father, I pray that your word would be so alive with us that we would respond from a heart of saying, yes, God, I want all that you have for me. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Again, you may care what it looks like, but it doesn't matter what it looks like. I want what the Father has. Not because I'm going to a Pentecostal church of God, but I am going into the presence of God daily in his presence. Amen.